And I'm going to have a, uh, our next speaker has a gentleman that he would like to have him introduce him. So I'm just going to pass the introduction duties over to Frank. Now Frank, uh, Frank is sort of a, a valuable asset to this little community. As a matter of fact, when Joyce came a couple years ago, he was uh, her personal chauffeur and bodyguard. Oh wait, well there's wrong Frank. Wrong. You're, oh. Okay, sorry. Oh, I know, I know that, I, okay. Oh, gosh. Oh, that Frank, there he is, okay. I got, I got, I got confused, it doesn't take much. All right, well, the, the gentleman who's going to introduce Mr. Bloom is an individual who was recently in the news. You see, the city of San Francisco is actually considering having his book included in the curriculum of the history department. It's a done deal. They're going to do it. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's not waste any more time if you've seen the book Addicted to War. And by the way, for those of you that, for those of you that got the Bush bonus bumper disc, there's a song on there called Addicted to War that was inspired by this gentleman's work. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Frank Doral. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and thanks, Payment, for having us. Um, it's my honor to introduce William Bloom, um, but it's true. Our a book, Addicted to War, has been uh, officially now voted unanimously by the San Francisco School Board and to be used by the history teachers, 10th grade for 12th grade, and it's kind of a big deal. I also want to say here, I'm a KPFK listener, and uh, KPFK has uh, uh, announced this event, and we got some KPFK people here today, so um, I want to introduce William Bloom. William Bloom has uh, written some of the most classic books on the history of the C CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, his book, Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Interventions Since World War II. It's in, like an encyclopedia of what the CIA has done around the world. It is kind of hard to read because it's kind of hard to take in how much evil and ba bad things the CIA has done. But William Bloom, who has worked for the State Department, he's been a teacher, he's been a screenwriter, but he's going to go down in, in um, history as a man who has brought us this book and this book, Rogue State, A Guide to the World, Only Superpower, two great books on the history of the CIA and U.S. foreign policy. Um, Bill, he's talking to somebody over there. <laughs> Okay, his books are in the, they're in the league with Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and Michael Parenti, and Bill tells it how it is. Bill Bloom coming up here, William Bloom. Thank you. Is this thing on? Yeah, I guess it is. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. A few weeks ago I, I spoke, it's an echo. A few weeks ago, I spoke at a university uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. It was the first time in the full year I had been uh, invited or allowed to speak on a campus. Since uh, January of, of, of last year, when, as some of you may know, um, in an audio tape, Osama bin Laden recommended that Americans read my book for a better understanding of why they have become anti-American terrorists. My, my, my book, Rogue State. Since that time, uh, I have been in effect banned from US campuses. And normally, I have a speaking engagement every other month or so there. Uh, five or six times, I was approached by faculty or students to speak. And I said, yes, I'd be glad to. And each time, they were unable to get the approval of the officials of the university. Um, when, when, I, when the Bin Laden tape was made public, I became an instant uh, celebrity. I was uh, on CNN with Wolf Blitzer and 45 Minutes on C-SPAN, MSNBC, all the big shows. Um, and in the, in the Washington, I live in Washington, D.C. And for, for over 10 years, I had been sending in letters to the Post uh, commenting on their poor coverage of U.S. foreign policy, and not one letter had been printed. Now, all of a sudden, my photo was on page one of the post, and there was a long story about me inside. But since then, 
It's been the same pattern. They still will not print my letters or any article I write. Uh, when I was on these programs, they kept asking me what I think about having my book endorsed by such a, an evil person as bin Laden. And my answer was this. There were two elements involved. On the one hand, I have nothing but loathing for any kind of religious fundamentalism, including the societies spawned by such fundamentalism, like the Taliban in Afghanistan. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm part of a worldwide movement which has a very ambitious goal of slowing down, if not stopping, the American empire and keeping it from continuing to do what it's been doing for a century, the invasions and the bombings, the overthrows of governments, the occupations, the torture, all of that. And so, and for, for, for this movement to have any, any chance of success, we have to reach the American public. And to reach the American public, we need access to the mass media. And so I was very glad, because of what happened with this, uh, this tape, to have the opportunity to have access to the mass media. And that's, that's the, that was the other side of the equation. Uh, and that's how I answered that question. Bin Laden, in his audio tape, he quoted part of a paragraph from one of my books. Uh, the, the full paragraph is this. If I were the president, I could stop terrorist attacks against the United States in a few days, permanently. I would first apologize very publicly and very sincerely to all the widows and the orphans, the impoverished and the tortured, and the millions of other victims of American imperialism. I would then announce that America's global interventions, including the awful bombings, have come to an end. And I would inform Israel that it is no longer the 51st state of the Union. But rather, oddly enough, they're a foreign country. <laughs> I would then reduce the military budget by at least 90% and use these savings to pay reparations to all our many victims around the world. And there would be more than enough money for that. Do you know what one year of the defense budget comes to? One year is equal to more than $30,000 per hour for every hour since Jesus Christ was born. That's what I would do on my first three days in the White House. On the fourth day, I would be assassinated. <laughs> Another reason I think bin Laden liked my book is that it challenged the myth that the White House has been pushing for years, that the reason there are anti-American terrorists. The reason they hate us is because of our alleged democracy and freedom, uh, because of our uh, secular government, uh, for, because of our films and our, our, our fashions and our television and so on, our whole way of life. But what the, what the anti-American terrorists, in fact, hate and which, are, which motivates them is not any of these things. They are motivated by American foreign policy. It's what we do to people in the Middle East, what we have done for the past 50 or 60 years that motivates them. If you look at my book in this chap same chapter, uh, I have a long list of the operations the US government has carried out in the Middle East since the 1950s. The many overthrows and invasions, the support of dictatorships, the support of Israel, uh, all kinds of things, the shooting down of passenger planes and the bombing of ships. This is uh, more than enough to make anyone hate us. And this is the reason that we, the, which gives rise to these anti-American terrorists. It's not, it's not our alleged democracy or freedom or our fashions. Um, and it works the same all over the world. From the 50s until the 80s, for three decades, the U.S. interventions in Latin America were just as widespread and just as awful as our interventions in the Middle East. 
And what happened? What, what was the result of all these interventions? Countless terrorist acts against American targets, against American military targets, civilian targets, American corporations. They assassinated uh, um, um, ambassadors. It's just the same cause and the same effect. People don't like being invaded and bombed and having the governments overthrown. It's that simple. Uh, if, if, if the Catholics in Latin America had the same belief as Muslims, as some Muslims do, that killing the, or fighting against the great Satan would uh, lead them to heaven and all the, all the virgins there, supposedly, uh, there, there would have been a rash of suicide bombings in Latin America all those years for the same reasons. I don't think, by the way, that poverty plays much of a role in the creation of terrorists. We mustn't confuse terrorism with revolution. Keep in mind that the, the terrorists, or the alleged terrorists of 9-11, were all middle and upper class people, and bin Laden himself was or, or is or was a millionaire. For many years, Going back to the Korean War, it's been very fashionable for the left wing all over the world to accuse, to, to uh, say that the US government only bombs um, third world countries or people of color or um, Muslims. And they, they accuse the US government in effect of being racist. But that's fallacious. Um, keep in mind that in 1999, the US government for 78 days and nights, without, without a break, bombed Yugoslavia, white Christian Europeans. So the US government, in effect, is a, an equal opportunity bomber. <laughs> there, were only, there were only two qualifications, only two th criteria to qualify to be a, a US bombing target. One, you have to present some kind of obstacle to the desires of the empire, and two, you have to have very poor or non-existent defense against aerial attacks. Um, another foreign policy myth, uh, which has to do with the American motivations for its interventions, is the is this? I I, I like to pose this question: What is U.S. foreign policy? have in common with Mae West. The story is told about Mae West at the height of her fame and fortune as a Hollywood sex pot. She had this mansion, and she, one day she had a visitor who looked around the mansion and said, my goodness, what a lovely home you have. And Mae West said, goodness had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and and that's, that's what I try that's what I try to impart to my readers and my listeners about U.S. foreign policy. Goodness has nothing to do with it. If I were to write a book called The American Empire for Dummies, on page one I would say, don't look for any moral factor in U.S. foreign policy. It's not there. Um, but the average American thinks that the government, our government, in its foreign dealings is motivated by the best of intentions, that they, they really mean well. Uh, they, they will admit that our government lies and, and breaks the law sometimes, and sometimes even causes a bit more harm than good, but they are convinced that the, the intentions are, are the best. The, the motivations are honorable and, and noble, and that is a very tough barrier to overcome. When I'm discussing US foreign policy, or like, like the war in Iraq, with the average American, they can't, they often can't get beyond that barrier. They'll say, yeah, I know, yeah, I know that, yeah, but they, but they still think the intentions are good, and unless you deal with that, you're gonna be facing this brick wall of, of their mind. Um, but how are such people, how are we to understand what has taken place in the past 60 years? In, in that time period, 
the US government has attempted to overthrow more than 50 foreign governments. It has dropped bombs on the people of more than 30 nations. It has attempted to assassinate more than 60 foreign leaders. It has helped to suppress dozens of populist or nationalist movements. And it has tortured thousands. And it has seriously been involved in interventions in almost every nation on the face of the earth in that time period, and in the, in the process of which they have caused the end of life for a few million people and have caused a life of despair for, for millions more. So I repeat the question, what are we to make of all this? Um, and in this book, The American Empire for Dummies, the reason I would emphasize this is that unless you get beyond that barrier, you will, you, will never get, you will never get beyond the cliches and the platitudes they feed us all. Now, I know it's not easy at all for, for the average American to accept what I'm saying, to, to swallow what I'm saying. They see their leaders in the press. They see the, the, the pictures on TV. They see them smiling and laughing. They see them with their families telling jokes. They hear them speak of peace and freedom and democracy and justice and human rights and even baseball. How can such people be moral monsters? They have names like George and Donald and, and Dick. There's not a single Abdullah or Muhammad in the bunch. And they all speak English. Well, George almost does. <laughs> We know that people named Abdallah, Abdullah and Muhammad cut off an arm or a leg as punishments for theft. We're too civilized for that. We would never do that. But people named Donald and Dick and George go around the world dropping millions of cluster bombs, and the many unexploded ones become landmines. And very soon, a child comes along and steps on one, and loses an arm or a leg, or maybe two limbs, or even his eyesight. Um, and our noble leaders use another weapon even more horrible than cluster bombs, depleted uranium, also known as DU, which gives, which uh, puts into the tips of, of its weapons, into shells and, and missiles, um, the uranium, which is full of radiation, and when these weapons hit a target, they explode, they explode into a very fine mist of radioactive particles, which can, can and are breathed in by anyone nearby. And this gives rise to, this poisons the air, it poisons the soil, it poisons the, the, the water, and it, it, it kills the one's lungs and one's blood and one's genes. And it leads to all manner of horrible illnesses, rare illnesses in the, in the individuals who are infected with the DU and in their offspring. If, if, there, if this world would take uh, DU as seriously as it does AIDS, and DU is, is also an international crisis and, and a disgrace, it, it, it should be banned, categorically banned, by, by the world community. But because of U.S. In power and influence, it's, it's not uh, banned at all. Um, pardon me, I have my pages a bit mixed up here. Very stupid thing to do. Uh, okay, sometimes I, I, when I read my argument with one of these people who are so convinced that the U.S. government means well and, and I can't reach them at all, I sometimes ask them, what would the government have to do in its foreign policy which would cause you to stop supporting them? What for you would be too much? And I've never gotten the clear answer to that. I suspect they, they know that if, whatever they might name, I will say, ha, we've already done that. 
So I, the, the question is still a good question you can keep in mind for other people. You should also question this thing called, called democracy, which we are told by our leaders that they support every day of the week. Uh, in the past, but in the past 60 years, the U.S. government has attempted to overthrow dozens of democratically elected governments, sometimes successfully and sometimes not. They have also grossly interfered in dozens of democratic elections all over the world. It would be difficult to name a brutal dictatorship of the second half of the 20th century which was not supported by U.S. foreign policy. Not just supported, but put into power and kept in power against the wishes of their own people. So in light of all this, uh, the question is, what do the Bolsheviks mean by the term democracy, which they talk about? I must say that the last thing they have in mind is any kind of economic democracy doing away with the immense gap between those who are in abject poverty and those for whom too much is not enough. But the first thing they have in mind is enhancing the, uh, the, the accessibility of, the, of international corporations to globalization and for the installation of American military bases. Any government which agrees to the globalization and to the bases is well on the way to being termed a democracy by the White House. <laughs> Another point to keep in mind when, when discussing Iraq, that even if Iraq had, in fact, all those terrible weapons we accuse them of having, what would, so what? The biggest lie is that it is not that they didn't have uh, that they had these weapons. The biggest lie is that even if they had the weapons, what danger would they have been to the U.S.? What reason could Saddam Hussein possibly have had to invade the U.S. government, other than having an irresistible desire for mass national suicide? And the same thing applies to Iran. What possible reason would Iran have? for invading the U.S., or even Israel. They would be wiped out immediately. Israel is close enough to, 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 to make Iran, the entire nation, into a pile of dust. They have no good reason. They're, they're not maniacs, you know, these people. Even if we don't care for certain aspects of their societies, they are not maniacs. Oddly enough, many people who are very much opposed to the war in Iraq support what the U.S. government has done in Afghanistan since 2001. Um, they think that's just fine. It's, after all, it's getting revenge for 9-11. What's, what's wrong with that? But in a rational world, uh, revenge is taken against those who are responsible for a crime. Now, what is the evidence that the people of Iraq, of, of Afghanistan, are responsible for 9-11? We have killed tens of thousands of people there. And can anyone name a single Afghan uh, who has even been named as being involved in nine, of those tens of thousands, can anyone name even one who has been accused of being involved in 9-11? Even assuming the government story is correct, obviously. Even if, if, even if you give them that, credit. Their story is exactly what happened. Who are these Afghans they're killing in revenge? Whatever one thinks of the appalling society created by the Taliban in Afghanistan, oh boy. the fact remains that they were in the, that uh, uh, bin Laden and al-Qaeda were invited in by one man, their leader, Muhammad Omar. Why should the entire society be penalized for the action of one individual? It's like me being punished, or you, because of the hundreds of terrorists in Miami. The anti, the anti Castro terrorists in Miami have carried out literally hundreds of terrorist acts over the years. 
and why how, would it make any sense for some for Cuba or some other country to invade the United States because of, of the presence of these people in Miami and bomb your house or my house? What do we have to do with that? What do the Afghan people in Af Afghanistan have to do with with the Al Qaeda people being there who were invited? I say by one 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 person. If Timothy McVeigh, who carried out the bombing in Oklahoma City, again, if you want to, if you want to accept the government point of view, if if he, why why didn't the U.S. government, if he had not been caught right away, why didn't they bomb the state of Michigan or Texas or any of the other places where he lived? You know, it makes as much sense as to bomb Afghanistan. Um, so now NATO is playing a major role in, in the killing fields of Afghanistan. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is, is fighting in Southeast Asia. Uh, does anyone here have a map, of the, a map of the world? It's not simply that NATO doesn't belong in Southeast Asia. NATO has no reason even to exist. What, what is the reason NATO still exists? It was founded, supposedly, we were all told, in the 1950s or the late 40s to prevent a Soviet invasion of, of Western Europe. In case you haven't heard, the Soviet Union has not existed since 1991. They, the Soviets ended the, their Warsaw Pact with their clear understanding that the West would, would put an end to NATO. Of course, it hasn't happened. NATO, the US finds NATO too valuable a tool to use in its foreign policy. They can do all kinds of things in the name of NATO without being attacked personally as, as the US. Like the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999 was con continually referred to and still is referred to as a NATO operation. Afghanistan and Iraq were bombed with seemingly no worry about the thousands of new anti-American terrorists which would be, who would be created. And they were warned by the CAA, warned the government, and other people, many think tanks, gave these warnings. If you invade uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, you're going to create thousands of new anti-American terrorists. And yet, since the first bombs fell in Afghanistan in 2001, there have been scores of terrorist attacks against American targets all over the world, in, the so in South Asia, in the Middle East, and even in the Pacific. Uh, including two major attacks against American soldiers and their allies in Indonesia with a large loss of life. So the next time you hear an American official bragging about how the war on terrorism uh, is a success because there have not been any attacks against America since 9-11, say, ha, 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 yes. He's overlooking the dozen scores of attacks against Americans all over the world. You might also ask him, well, how many such attacks were there in the U.S. before 9-11? Um, <clears throat> sometimes when I have a discussion with somebody about Iraq, and they have no other argument to give uh, against what I'm saying, they'll say to me in, in desperation, well, tell me one thing. Aren't you happy that Saddam Hussein is out of power? And I say, no. And they say, no. And I say, imagine that you had a bad knee and you went into surgery to have, the, uh, to, for, for, to have that knee worked on. And by mistake, the surgeon amputated your entire leg. And then I came to visit you and I said, and you're very sad, and I said, well, aren't you happy that you no longer have a knee problem? <laughs> So the, the, the people of Iraq no longer have a Saddam problem, but they've paid a terrible price. And many of them, of course, supported, supported him. Let me take you back a bit now to, to, to my time during the Cold War. If you think what you have now is a lot of deceit and lies, let me tell you, in the Cold, in cold, the cold War, the, the big lie, the big huge lie they pounded into our heads from childhood on was that there was out there, there was something called the International Communist Conspiracy. 
uh, headquarters in Moscow and active in every country on the face of the earth, looking to destroy everything decent and holy, looking to enslave us all. You couldn't, ens uh, you couldn't escape it. That's what they taught us in our schools, in our churches, in our school books, in our comic books. The, the red menace, it was given to us as more dangerous than Al-Qaeda is today. It was international. You couldn't escape it. And almost every American believed it. I myself was a good, loyal anti-communist until I was past the age of 30. And I even went to work for the State Department, planning on becoming a foreign service officer so I could do my share in the great anti-communist crusade. Then a thing called Vietnam came along and changed my thinking and my entire life. It was all a con game. There was never any such animal as the international communist conspiracy. What there was was people all over the third world fighting for economic and social change, changes which didn't coincide with the needs and desires of the American power elite. And so the, the American power elite moved to crush those movements and those governments. And they called their actions fighting communism, fighting the, the red menace. Even though the Soviet Union was hardly present at all in almost all of these scenarios. And if you doubt that, you, you, must, you must read my books. I, that's a subject I deal with in great detail. Remember, the Cold War ended in 1991. The international communist conspiracy was no more, no more red threat, and nothing changed in US foreign policy. What do we make of that? The US continued with its interventions and its bombings and its overthrows just like before. What does that tell you? It tells me that the so-called Communist, communist menace was simply an excuse for the, for the American empire to intervene all over the world. <coughs> During the Cold War, Washington, Washington officials, of course, couldn't say they were intervening to fight against social change. So they said they were intervening They said they were intervening to fight against this thing called communism. Uh, and of course, fighting a communist menace, and of course, fighting for democracy and freedom. Just like today, the White House can't say it's invaded Iraq to expand the American empire, or, or for the oil, or for the corporations, or for Israel. So it says it's fighting terrorism. During the Cold War, the word communist was used exceptionally loosely, just as loosely as the word al-Qaeda is used today, or terrorist. Any individual or government or movement which the US government wants to um, condemn is called al-Qaeda. They're members of al-Qaeda. That's what we hear again and again. As if, as if being a member of al-Qaeda the, for that, there was a, a clear and meaningful distinction made. As if people retaliating against the American empire because, as members of Al-Qaeda is different from people retaliate, retaliating against the American empire who are not members of Al-Qaeda. As if being a member of Al-Qaeda means you, you have a membership card that fits into your wallet. Uh, that you have a, a, a weekly newsletter you put out, and that there's a, a potluck on the first Thursday of each month. <laughs> U.S. policy keeps creating these anti-American terrorists who Washington calls Al-Qaeda, and we then have to intervene to stop Al-Qaeda, this new, this new Al-Qaeda group, and so in the process of which we form new anti-American terrorist groups who we then call Al-Qaeda, and, and, and that's the process. It's just a, a word game to throw you off the scent. And the scent leads to, to the American empire. Keep this in mind. Following the bombing of Iraq in 1991, 
the U.S. wound up with military bases in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates. Following its bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, the U.S. wound up with military bases in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, Yemen, and Djibouti. Following its bombing and invasion of Iraq in 2003, the U.S. Oh, I'm sorry. Following its invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 and 2, the U.S. government wound up with military bases in Afghanistan. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I've lost my place. Okay, following the bombing and invasion of Iraq in 2003, the U.S. government wound up with Iraq. This is not subtle foreign policy. This is not exactly covert operations. The men who, who run our foreign policy are not easily embarrassed. But that's the way the empire grows. A base in every region prepared to put down any threat to the empire real or imagined. 62 years after the end of World War II, the U.S. still maintains major bases in Germany and Japan. 54 years after the end of the war in Korea, the U.S. still maintains tens of thousands of armed forces in South Korea. Um, let me turn now to something uh, at home. I'm glad the Democrats one control of Congress, but I have no illusions about their foreign policy. Uh, many of them uh, have views on, on Iraq and, and Israel, for example, which are not uh, to my liking at all. They're, they're not even, some of them are not even liberal. They were chosen to be candidates and supported by the Democrats by people in, who, in charge of whom was Ram, Ram uh, what's his name? Ram Emanuel, the congressman from Illinois, who at one time fought in the Israeli army, as did his father. So ideology is a very important concept, and it's often ignored by, by activists. They, they sometimes they confuse themselves. Um, take, for example, the, the talk shows. They like to show a liberal versus a conservative. And therefore, they, th they say they're giving you a balanced point of view. But typically, the conservative is a neoconservative on the, f on the far right end of the political spectrum. And the liberal is someone ever so slightly to the left of center. This is not a balanced point of view whatsoever. In fact, it's, it, it, it does even more harm than good. The average listener who's not very sophisticated about ide ideology, sees this and he thinks he's getting a balanced point of view. But in effect, in effect, all he's getting is two versions of the same world view. There's the uh, conservative uh, view of imperialism, of bomb them to hell, and, and the liberal point of view of, of imperialism, which is imperialism with a slightly uh, kind face. A more appropriate balance on such discussions would, would be a conservative balanced by a, a radical leftist or, or a progressive or a Marxist. American liberals are typically closer to conservatives on foreign policy than they are to those on the left. And um, similarly, if they discuss health uh, care, for example, the conservatives give their Mickey Mouse solutions to our health care problem, and the liberals give their Mickey Mouse solutions to the health problem. Sometimes for a variation, one side or the other might, might speak of some Donald Duck solution to the health problem. But the fundamental difference between liberalism and Marxism is that Liberalism sees a problem, such as America's being the world's bully, and sees a problem to be uh, a, a, sees a problem of bad policy, while the Marxist sees it as something that flows logically from the U.S. economic 
or military interests. When a liberal sees a beggar, he says the system has failed. When a Marxist sees a beggar, he says the system is working. <laughs> well, let me close now with the two laws of politics which came out of Watergate in the 1970s, which I like to cite. The first law of Watergate says that no matter how paranoid you are, what the US government is actually doing is worse than you imagine. The, 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 the second law of Watergate says, don't believe anything until it's been officially denied. Both laws are still on the books, and I thank you very much. Questions? Uh, one question. End, end of the day, they said question. Not now. Well, I've been waiting half an hour well, for question. Yeah, I don't mind. I, okay. I don't want to shoot questions. I, I finished early, so. Thank you. We're not allowed to take any questions from this time. We'll get the master ceremonies up here in just a second. Well, I will ask my question, and he can answer it in the evening. Um, you Is said that. that what the government says? No questions? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, you said that. Um, the terror, uh, Mr. Bloom, I think Mr. Bloom must be a very nice man because he's so opposed to all the evil that's going on. But Mr. Bloom and his fellow lift leftists really puzzle me, and so I have a really big question for them and for Mr. Bloom. Now, Mr. Bloom said, terrorism is not caused by poverty. I agree the terrorists are named George, Dick, and Ronald, and they are not poor. <laughs> now, those are the real terrorists. Now, Mr. Bloom, you said that Iraq would have no reason to attack the United States in a terrorist attack because they get annihilated, because they would be maniacs, would be suicidal maniacs. Who are all these other suicidal maniacs? Why are they attacking us so that they will get annihilated? Why are they doing this? Saddam Hussein is who I'm speaking about. He is not a maniac. Al-Qaeda is a creation of CIA. Do you know that? Have you looked at the evidence? Have you watched 9-11 Mysteries? Have you read 9-11 Synthetic okay. Terror? Okay. Well, well, uh, this, this, person, this person doesn't want to hear me answer, so, okay. I don't accept all the things that you believe. Is that, is that uh, allowed? I, I have my own views, and I've given my views. I don't think the U.S. government was behind 9-11. Okay, just uh, let me finish one, no, one, last, no, one on, last point. I would like to finish later. very quickly. I will be blessed in one minute. Mr. Bloom said, Mr. No, one, no, less than one minute. Mr. Bloom said, that he asked people, what would it take, what would it take for, I'm going to finish, it's less than one minute, what would it take for the average American to oppose U.S. foreign policy? What it would take is for them to know that 9-11 was an inside job. Well, hi, everybody. 